I'm in a little green bubble, which is exactly how it feels right now, to be honest with you. And when I as I finish, I'll walk you around um, where we are, which is the innovation zone in, in COP. And um, what I wanted to talk to you about really was a couple of things. I wanted to give you an indication of what, what the vibe is here, how it feels. Um, I want to give you some update on what's been agreed and what hasn't been agreed. Uh, and that's interesting and changing like really quickly. Um, and then I'm going to give you some reasons to be cheerful. Um, but uh, sustainable textiles is something that I've been involved with for what seems like forever, actually, mainly because of poverty, not poverty, but student to student poverty, having to buy secondhand clothes was actually a godsend because you end up not not consuming. Right. So that's one of the main the main ways that I um, that I, I work on my textiles. And every every year, three years, I have a year of no new clothes which is brilliant as a reset, just to kind of like get rid of that desire to consume, which is often never about what you're buying. It's always about how you feel. So we shop as an antidepressant and that's, that's really interesting and speaks of a much deeper malaise with the human, um, the human psyche or maybe just my psyche. Um, so I, I think that's really fascinating. And then we see this general rejection of fast fashion, which isn't always bad. It isn't always bad. So, so there's some really interesting debate there and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing that later. But in terms of, in terms of COP, Jesse asked me just to kind of give a, a feeling of, of what it's like. So, so first off, there's a little feeling of eco Disney. There's a very sort of like, almost like green cocking to, to quote my friend, my friend Claire. Um, she uses this phrase, you know, look at me, aren't, aren't I green? Um, and you might be doing a little bit of good stuff. This is a business phrase rather than an, although actually it applies to individuals, maybe more interestingly. Um, and there's a little bit of feeling of that, right? There's lots of selfies in front of the, the flower background that hey, I was at COP um, and, and, my, and, I, and I, don't, I don't reject or, 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 or that doesn't revolt me, revolts me in any way. But I wonder if when you go home, it's a bit like going to centre parks. You, 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 you leave your car on the edge of the place, you cycle everywhere, you eat locally, you talk to people and say hello, and then get back in your car, drive home and become the person that you were before you went. And I just, I just fear that we may see a corporate version of that. While we're here, everyone cares. But what happens when we've got to go back and we enter into what is inevitably going to be a very difficult economic period over the next five years? Um, so there's that little bit of feeling of that, actually. Um, but I, I, I'm going to sit on the positive side of cynicism and say, I think people are changing their attitudes and, and the public are, right? So you're, you, all of you lot, um, you'll hold everyone to account if this doesn't happen. So um, that, that excites me. So what, what about the big announcements here? Well, f firstly, the really big announcement, um, and we yet to see it, but it's coming out, it's coming, I think, tomorrow, um, is likely to be uh, guaranteed or uh, uh, guaranteed targets for carbon reduction and this $100 billion a year to help poorer nations cope with climate change. I spoke at an event yesterday about sustainable agriculture and there were 39 people with three minutes each. And I was, guess, I was 39th in that. And my analogy was gonna be, if all you lot take all the time, I'm gonna end it with, with nothing at the, at the end. And, and there's an analogy on global wealth there, an analogy on global resource use. So I did make that analogy because it would have been, it would have been wrong of me not to. Um, and, and I think this hundred billion dollars a year is, is really important. I don't know whether it's enough, but I think it really matters. And then the big news that came in um, end of yesterday was this kind of like sideshow of China and America working together um, to, to, to come up with a, an agreed reduction in, in carbon emitted. And that is, that's more important than we can genuinely acknowledge. Not because the number matters, the number does matter, but because of the signal that sends to the rest of the world, Australia, are you listening, right? It sends that signal to the rest of the world that actually this is so important. We can even put this kind of thing aside. And look, I'm, I'm 53. Right? I've, got, I've got a granddaughter. I've been doing this for 32 years. I've failed. Becky, she's failed. She's the same age, a bit younger, probably, but same-ish age as me. We have failed to explain the complexity and the challenge in an articulate way so that people come with us. It's taken 
crisis to make that happen. And maybe, maybe it always was going to. But right now, I'm feeling really positive in the light of those two things. So what else is going on? So the leaders of, 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 from over 100 countries have, um, have, have promised to re- stop deforestation by 2030. Now, that's amazing. That, that accounts for 85 percent of the world's forests. And that's really important. Forests are not the only sink. Oranges are not the only fruit. Forests are not the only sink. And I think if we look at things like seagrass, plankton, if we look at things like soils, we can see a more powerful sink that is less visible. So, so yes, amazing and really, really good, good news. What else can we do that is maybe less, less visible, maybe a little less totemic? And how, and how, do, we, how do we pay Brazil to do nothing? That's fundamentally what we have to do because everyone has a right to, 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 to kind of turn their resources into, into income. We, we have, right? The global north has. So, so we need to be very careful how we manage the politics and ethics of, of this. But that's great, great news on, on trees. Methane scheme to cut 30% of current methane emissions by 2030, agreed by more than 100 countries. Brilliant. Can we bring it forward? Both of those things. Can we make it 2025? I, I don't see why we can't for methane. Um, and this is the biggie, or potentially one of the biggies, coal. More than 40 countries, including the major coal users of Poland, Vietnam and Chile, have agreed to shift away from coal. It's the single biggest contributor to climate change. It's thought. We can debate that. Um, and although there's been loads of progress here, still 37% of the world's electricity in 2019 was generated by coal. In the UK, it's significantly less. It's basically zero. And if you're interested in this, and, and who wouldn't be? I mean, I'm fascinated by this world. There's a little app you can get on your iPhone or other phones are available, although I don't know why you'd bother, um, which is um, called Grid Carbon. And it tells you exactly, at this point today, exactly what the carbon intensity of our energy supply is. It's, it's really powerful. I'm going to finish with, with a bit of that as well. So that's really good. Super, super important there. And then in terms of cash, there's this incentive to try and get corporations to pay for this. And this really matters. Look, corporations garner more trust than governments. That's proven year on year by the Edelman Barometer of Trust. That's, that's really interesting. And between them, the top 450 financial organizations control 130 trillion dollars of wealth and they've agreed to back clean technology and that could be renewable energy or it could be sustainable agriculture who, who knows where that will go but to refinance to rearrange their finance systems away from fossil fuels towards new technologies hey that's where the growth is right this is no the smart people have been doing this for ages so so that is probably more powerful than the coal agreement probably really really interesting so that's what's going on. It feels very positive. It feels, it, look, I'm in a green bubble here and I'm in a green bubble out there as well. Everyone is going, yeah, there's a little bit hand ringing, a little bit of, oh, we've not probably done enough soon enough. Absolutely. But things seem to be moving forward. And just to give you a few reasons to be cheerful before I, if I have time, I'll walk you around. I'll, I'll be indicated on here, I, I guess. Um, but there are some reasons to be cheerful. I think it's quite, obvious that we're not going to hit 1.5. I think keeping 1.5 alive as a dreadful soundbite goes is not possible. I think realistically we're going to be hitting two and a half. Um, 2.4 was, 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 was the UN report from the other day and I think that's probably on the conservative side. This is, this is really scary. It's unnerving in fact. Um, but there are some positives. First up, when I started working in this field in 1991 we had a carbon grid intensity of about 700 grams of carbon per kilowatt that that, that's huge that's absolutely huge um when i started measuring it properly 10 15 years ago we were at 560 grams of carbon per kilowatt right now today and i checked this morning on my way in we're at 159 grams of carbon per kilowatt in the uk It'll be less in France because of the nuclear, the nuclear power system there. And we still draw a little bit of that, not, not much now, but a little bit of that into the UK. And it will be shared around Europe. The, the, the interconnectors across Europe are incredibly effective. So we've reduced it by at least fourfold. That's, that's amazing. That is a reason to be cheerful. The second reason to be cheerful is right now, as I'm talking to you, there's a probe drilling down 
from Cornwall, from the Eden Center, going straight down, it's funded by the Eden Center, straight down five kilometers. And it's looking to see how effective and how cost effective we can draw heat up to then drive steam turbines to then produce electricity. And we're bringing water up at four kilometers, we're bringing water up at about 156 degrees. This is amazing, superheated water coming up at 156 degrees. So talking to the people at the Earth Center only three weeks ago, they feel that we can power the world with renewable energy like that within, within 10 years. Now, maybe they're wrong and it's gonna be twice that, 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 that length of time. I'll take that, right? Tim Smith is leading a team there that is doing extraordinary, extraordinary work. And then we've got the, the beginnings of a revolution in the way that we farm. If we, if we can get 0.4% carbon in the soil, if we can increase the amount of carbon in the soil, we can treble it. We can begin to reverse the impact of climate change within the next 20 years. This is astonishing. And we don't need to do anything, right? Everything else needs us to, 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 to do something. This needs us to do nothing other than to ask, can I have regeneratively grown food, please? Tell me about your farm. And there's a really massive opportunity here. And I haven't even got on to seagrass. Seagrass is incredible. And, and the whole seaweed world is phenomenal. If you look at the interest that we've got in antibiotic development, that is all happening in the bit between the land and the sea. There's so much positivity happening around there. So regenerative agriculture is a, is a huge opportunity. It's also laced with challenges. The words, right, straight off, regenerative agriculture is very triggering because we used to farm in the West, we used to farm that way, and then we wiped it out. So now it's the indigenous populations that farm that way. And, and the risk is we will be stealing, borrowing and, and, and kind of misappropriating what they do. So we need a, an, another way of talking about it. And we need to honor where, it, where it's come from or where, where it currently sits at the moment. So there's some politics around that I think are really important, actually. And we need to do that. So regenerative agriculture not only can, can sequester carbon at a phenomenal rate, but it increases the income for the, for the farmer. So there is, a, there is a social equity element to this as well. And this is, look, this is what blockchain was for. We, blockchain is not about cryptocurrencies. They're a mechanism of exchange. Blockchain is about rewarding the farmer, rewarding the maker more effectively for what they do than the current system where you've got loads of people in the middle. And, and we, if we use blockchain properly, we can solve so, so many problems. It, I'm not talking about NFTs, right? They're, they're great, but that's not what I'm talking about. And then when we look at transportation, and there's some lunacy here, right? There's some utter craziness here. So, so first off, um, there's this dreadful EV outside. It's like a desert racing car, and it's an EV. Now, that, that just sums up everything that's wrong with, with, with the direction of some of the green cocking that, that we're going through. So you make an EV that can race through the desert with less impact. It's racing through the desert. It's full of impact. We look at the other stuff that's happening, it's really interesting. The Tesla Model 3 was the best selling car in the UK and across Europe in September. That's, you would, if you'd have said that a year ago, everyone would have laughed at you. I'm not saying electric vehicles are the answer. They're part of the answer for, for now. So we've got this opportunity where things are beginning to look more positive if we seek out the light. If we look for it, they're, they're there. If we don't look for it, then obviously the overriding feeling is one of negativity and, and, and panic. And it's important that we have both the carrot and the stick. I think it really, really matters. I don't know how long that is. Is that about 15 minutes, Jesse? Am I, am I about right? Do you want a quick look around the show? Do you want me to, if this is just no, yeah, no, I'm take just, us on I'm going to have to walk around. Do, do that at the end. I need to see the show. Come on. And it's a little bit overheated. This, this is salutary. So this is... Um, this is Mumbai at two different temperatures, two different uh, uh, levels of sea level. And it's, if I'm honest, it's a little bit scary. All of these are amazing. And then this, this one here, there's some incredible data on this screen here. And this screen shows a whole range of scenarios that are building and falling. And then over here, we've got the BMW circular car. So this car is made of circular materials and it's an EV, and it's not drivable yet, but it is absolutely stunning. So that's that one. And then we've got a lot of stuff on, on energy. 
Scotland lead the way on so much here. Then we've got the uh, Springfield Agri stand there. UPS have got this amazing pedal power delivery vehicle. I actually really fancy a go on this because it'd be good training for me. And then we've got over here, we've got GridServe. These are the people that have bought the, um, that have bought the Ecotricity network and they're changing the way that you can charge vehicles. That's there. And then in this corner, this will be the last bit I'll show you. In this corner, we've got um, a complete focus on the way that we heat our homes. Because we've, we've got to phase out gas soon. And consequently, um, this area is the bit that interests me. It's super, super exciting. So that's just a little, tiny little spin around what we've got here. Thank <laughs> you.